Hello, everyone. I'm Yasmin Taj, editor, ETHR World International and head of branded content for the Economic Times. And with great pleasure, I welcome you all to another episode of the video interview series brought to you by ETHR World Southeast Asia in collaboration with N Paradigm on the theme, Talent Management and Development for the Future of Work. In recent years, we have closely observed how so many obstacles can impede large-scale initiatives, but an organization that has the capabilities in store to act quickly on valuable opportunities will ultimately be the winning organization. Empowering people with the right career development tools and skills gives people enormous power to make their organizations more agile and resilient. But an agile learning culture can't be built alone. It can only be designed when partners across the organization can come together to listen to employees themselves and understand how they wish to learn, unlearn, and relearn. To understand the different priorities that will help l and lead the way in 2023 and beyond, and to help organizations plan a future that starts with learners and their needs, we have come up with this exclusive video interview series on the topic talent management and development for the future of work. And for this exclusive episode, it is a pleasure to welcome Mahalakshmi, our head HR Southeast Asia at Mondelez International, and John Cherian, CEO of N Paradigm. Mahalakshmi is the HR head Southeast Asia for Mondelez International. Prior to that, she has been the director of human resources at Mondelez India, leading the people strategy and transformation agenda for the business. She's part of the Mondelez Asia Middle East and North Africa People Leadership Team and a member of the Mondelez Global Extended Leadership Team. She has over 24 years of experience in HR and business consulting across India, Africa, UK, and now Southeast Asia. She has deep experience of embedding innovation and driving large-scale transformation, working with talent in over 20 countries with over 50 nationalities. She started her career with big five consulting firms like Anderson and EY, and went on to work with telecom, pharma, and FMCG players across markets. Passionate about transformation, <clears throat> powering growth, inclusion, talent strategy, and creativity, Maha is a certified life coach and enjoys music and storytelling. She has written for many publications and was adjudged the Accenture Economic Times Women Leader of the Year 2021. Thank you, Maha, for joining us. It is a pleasure to have you for this episode. Thank you for having me, um, and uh, lovely to connect with both of you. Absolutely. And next up, we have with us John Chirion, who's CEO of N Paradigm. His endeavor to make the complex simple and his belief in the power of learning to make people and businesses better has been the significant driving force in the N Paradigm journey. A journey that brings together business thought, learning methodology, and user experience into the technology-driven learning platforms. The understanding of unconscious competence and how to help businesses get there is his field of permanent study. John, thank you for joining us once again for this episode. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yasmin. Great. So without any further ado, let me invite both Maha and John to share the insights on the very interesting topic that we have for this interview. Uh, Maha, I'd like to start with you. What are some of the top trends that you're seeing that are driving the talent management and development function this year especially? And how do you think has l and played a role in uplifting the entire function in the recent years? Uh, okay, so that's many, many things in a go, but uh, yeah, I would say, you know, perhaps the, the big shifts that are happening as one thinks about talent is uh, twofold. Uh, one is obviously talent is in service of business and businesses are going through uh, a lot of change. Uh, and, uh, you know, as one looks at the, you know, the economic landscape and how businesses are coping to thrive and survive, uh, absolutely important is becoming agility. And I think the other thing that's happening is uh, the world around us continues to be dynamic and unpredictable. So the biggest challenge, perhaps, as uh, most of us in the people function step back and plan and strategize is the ability to be dynamic and agile, because the reality is that the variability is very high and our ability to respond with speed is super important. And perhaps both learning and, you know, the talent development specializations are adapting to that reality of uh, need for agility. Uh, so gone are the days where you could make a talent strategy or a succession plan, which had a two-year, three-year, five-year horizon. Uh, not to say that long-term is not important, but perhaps it is losing relevance beyond a point because our ability to predict you know, where things are headed uh, is 
more in the realm of let's pivot in an agile way than really gaze into you know long term future only uh, so agility is becoming very important and that's one shift equally from a talent uh, side of things and perhaps it got accentuated post covid people became very grounded on purpose you know why do i exist you know or uh, why do i work you know how much should i work uh, where do i want to work uh, and you know how do i want to grow and what does success mean a lot of these things uh, i think people spent a lot of time reflecting and introspecting uh, when covid put us all into that uh, zone of lockdown and thinking about life uh, a little more holistically the reality with that is talent today is making a lot of choices you know and a lot of choices around uh, being okay with doing things or not okay with doing things you know mobility is becoming a very big question mark and therefore we are revisiting uh, you know so our, at mondelez our succession approach is actually dynamic so we don't do succession planning once or twice a year it's a live document and uh, we realize that we need to find a way to ensure that our talent strategy as well as our learning strategy takes care of this perspective where the business reality is dynamic and the talent is being very very choiceful uh, so that you know we can make ourselves relevant and our strategies relevant uh, to the workforce wow that, those, those are very interesting points ma i think with the way we are living in a constant state of change and transformation so nothing is permanent anymore you you're doing things implementing things on the go and as you said organizations have to be agile with the kind of practices and initiatives they are coming up with align it with what the talent is looking for because the talent as you said is become very choosy they want they, they want they know what they need they have they want a purpose in life they're looking for more meaning and that has to align with the organizational goals for them so very interesting points around how the trends in this space are changing john what are your thoughts what trends are you seeing and how do you think the L&D function has kind of pivoted itself to these changes. Yes, so the L&D function always had two broad mandates, right? One was uh, to keep sustainability for the organization, right? As more and more people come through different roles, so each each employee maybe go grows through their employee life cycle and moves up the chain, or they move out of the organization. New people move in and they grow up, right? So one role for L&D was to keep that chain going, right? So even though the same role is eventually being performed by different people you know you get the kind of outcome that you want for the business right so that was one role the other very important role was to help the organize, organization innovate mm. right and get into new areas keep it agile right and be able to grab new opportunities or respond to sudden challenges or changes in the environment right so today uh, both these roles are very relevant right uh, with the fact that you know that uh, as maha mentioned being agile itself becomes a part of being sustainable mm. right so the lnd function has to blend both these roles together right and uh, how the lnd function is able to do this well uh, really is the testimony to its effectiveness for the organization Uh, great points again john thanks for sharing that i think yes the, the way the lnd function has evolved over time it's very interesting to see because it, it the role of the lnd professional has changed so much the whole responsibility of taking the organization to the next level i think that that kind of responsibility in aligning business with the needs of the employees i think that's that's going to be a core area of focus for them moving forward as well uh, maha while the function is changing and there's a lot of action happening here there are a lot of challenges that have emerged as as well what challenges are you seeing mostly in terms of your talent development function today i would perhaps put it as again shifts more than challenges you know and i think uh, perhaps gone are the days and i was reflecting as john was chatting you know i mean gone are the days where in you know learning and development was equal to training programs you know uh, i think uh, increasingly and you know even more as we think about future of work which we keep saying future of work is now it's no more in the future but uh, increasingly perhaps there is a lot of premium on a few things you know uh, there is tremendous premium and i don't know if you'd agree john on firstly learning agility you know as a skill you know so it is not really about 
you know, learning is something that the organization has to provide to the individual. Uh, how quickly are individuals learning to learn, you know, is perhaps becoming skill number one, you know, in many ways. I think he spoke about creativity, you know, imagination. Uh, and I think more and more as technology comes in, you know, to kind of do most of the transactional pieces of work, the place where uh, the human mind plays and where leaders play is in the realm of saying, can I actually not look at data, but look at the insight? and convert that insight to a meaningful decision. Uh, my ability to imagine possibilities, uh, paint a picture of the future, and then put in resources to kind of take us forward is really a skill that's at premium. So increasingly, learning agility is becoming a skill that is at premium, uh, and that defines success for the individual and success for the enterprise. Imagination, and therefore the ability to not just have insight, but perhaps foresight to where is the consumer and the customer going, and therefore where do I need to take the organization and how do I inspire everyone around it is becoming you know, premium. And therefore, most of the development plans that we make need to find a way to build that muscle in our people, because the more we have leaders who can take clear decisions, bring foresight to the table and have the humility to keep pivoting and learning as they go around the way, you know, the more successful we would be as an enterprise. And that is really the muscle that we are all focusing our energies on developing. Then the more functional skills can be picked up along the way because the reality is those functional skills may have a defined shelf life. The importance of different skills may change as the organization evolves. Uh, but the reality is if these fundamental muscles and skills are there, we can tide our way through and you know pick pick other things. Uh, so I think that's really some of the things that we are uh, grappling with. If I want to summarize Maha what you said in one line, you know, yeah. clarity, insight. Yeah. It's really about, yeah. Yeah. about that. And learning agility. You know, so I, I quite love the way when, when she was introducing you, she said making the complex simple, you know. I think as leaders learn to do that, you know, uh, that would be a big, big uh, capability that would help us not just have a vision, but to be able to distill and convey that to people at large. So yeah. it's easy to understand. And then, you know, we can kind of grow. Yeah, that's interesting. But do you find any challenges in this these shifts that you spoke about? Learning agility, imagination, building that muscle. Are you finding any kind of a challenge in building that up, these fundamental skills in your organization? Yeah, I would say, let me break this into two parts. You know, I mean, one is really um, things like learning agility. We hire for it and we look for it, you know, when we are looking for uh, talents, uh, you know, either to hire or promote. Yeah. However, maybe where we struggle a little bit is when we talk about resilience, you know, uh, we look for resilience, but actually how might we build that resilience, you know, is something that we don't have a solve for other than, uh, you know, back to my original premise of saying it's not a training program. So our approach to building resilience is actually in our talent and career framework. We have something called functional and shaping experience. So the Mondelez career uh, approach, which we call the career launch pad, actually says for people to grow, they need to get diverse functional experiences and diverse shaping experiences. And shaping experiences could be an experience at the head office where you're getting a broad perspective. Uh, it could be in an operating role. It could be in a situation wherein you're in a challenger market. You're a you know, small fry in a large market where you know, the competition is huge and you're small. And yes. an experience where you are a market leader striving to shape the industry you know and you don't you're not there fighting and fending competition so as you pick the ability to operate in all these shaping experiences you are growing as a leader yeah. and you're developing your ability for creativity your ability to uh, think innovatively and with clarity get into foresight and you know learn so for us it's it's a more experiential approach okay. i wish there were you know more uh, beyond experiential, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, educational insights kind of perspectives that we could provide along the journey. Uh, and I don't think we have a ready solve there beyond an experiential, uh, you know, approach to embedding some of these things. I don't know, I know and paradigm is deep into the realm of learning. I don't know if you have done these for any other, any other clients of yours. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, great points, first of all, I think, 
uh, what we see with a lot of customers today is, you know, to help build the resilience muscle, uh, doing what we call intentional disruption. Mm -hmm. Right, that you are actually telling your talent that you know what yesterday the, this was the plan, but now the plan has changed. Go figure it out. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and probably doing that and keeping them on their toes, and then looking out to see how they will respond to that becomes uh, a very nice way of. Uh, seeing whether you know talent can respond to the challenge that you're throwing to them, yeah. right? So there's a balance between uh, creating a safe environment, right? At the same time, also keeping in place enough risk and challenge, uh, so that you know people don't get complacent and people don't end up believing that no, the, the, everything is set, mm. right? And my plan is set, my strategy is set, my execution plan is set, and I just have to sit back. It doesn't work that way today, anyway, yeah, right? So Just to sick. respond to one of your mm -hmm. questions, one of the things that we do a lot is to build a lot of these simulation environments, right? Where, uh, you know, so one aspect is how do you give them that experience on the field, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that's a great way of building that muscle. Uh, so, of course, there are inherent challenges in terms of your bandwidth as an organization, the time, the money, the effort that it takes to kind of build that on the field. Uh, but we do a lot of that through simulations as well. Mm. Right. So you're able to simulate different, different scenarios. Mm. Uh, so for example, just when COVID hit, one of the simulations that we built was very similar to that, right? Mm -hmm. That a global crisis hits and suddenly your demand is down by 50%, whatever. Mm. Right. Mm. And there's no defined template, mm. right? Because no leader has experienced a scenario in the past where demand is just dropping by 50% overnight. Now there's no template. So how are you going to do this? Right? Yeah. So being able to do that, that's some place where technology and learning technology especially can really, really help. Yeah. No, and I think that's such a great uh, perspective and point that you just made, John. And back to the point that you were making, uh, Yasmin, on challenges, you know. What are the challenges that we now face as we now, you know, live the career launch pad at Mondelez is talent making a choice not to move, you know, and not to have that mobility uh, to get some of those shaping experiences, you know. So one of the things that we are really talking about is what do you stand to lose when you don't put your hand up for some of those stretch experiences? And maybe that's the place where, you know, simulations can, you know, play a big role. Uh, though no simulation fully substitutes an on-ground experience where things are completely like, you know, unpredictable. The fun side is, of course, in markets like where we operate in Southeast Asia, the external variabilities are always there, you know, so we don't need to simulate. I mean, there are governments bringing in new norms, you know, tax regimes change, uh, you know, and, and there are multiple variables, you know, I mean, uh, cost of some raw material goes up, uh, freight charges go for a change, and, you know, that completely provides a natural simulator, uh, which is really dynamic, more than what we will probably like it. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, the challenge where employees employees hesitate to change physical location to get space, uh, you know, some of these shaping experiences, uh, simulations can be a great complementary uh, that we can absolutely bring in. So thanks for sharing. Sure. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point because learning has to become so experiential today. It has to be a blended format where there's, where there's online learning, you give people personal space to learn, while you also give these kind of environments where they can learn. I think that kind of a blended approach combination is what will go uh, work going forward since that's how the, the whole space is evolving. So thanks, Maha, and join great points uh, sharing there. Maha, could you also tell us about a um, bit more about your learning initiatives that you've taken up at your organization and that has made learning more inclusive? And have you seen a change in the expectations that your workforce is having, which is more diverse and hybrid from the kind of learning experience you're creating for them? Oh, absolutely. So let me answer this both from the perspective of uh, the employee and the perspective of the organization. Right. Uh, so the organization very simply does not see learning as uh, behavioral. Uh, it is an enterprise-wide uh, you know, agenda and you're therefore looking at uh, enterprise capabilities, you know, which could range from revenue growth management, sustainability, uh, you know, uh, to, so I think there are not just functional and behavioral, but there are these blended needs, you know, which are coming up, which are important for the business to succeed and finding ways to infuse that capability, I, whether it is by hiring that talent, 
uh, sharing and borrowing that talent and therefore gig is becoming big and we'll talk we could talk about that if that's relevant and then you know finding ways to provide those experiences to people is becoming really important from an employee perspective and back to hybrid work and what the employee wants, I think bite-sized, you know, I mean, this has been on now for, I think, a decade where we said, you know, learning needs to be uh, snackable, you know, to use. Uh, so just like we snack on uh, biscuits and we snack on, uh, you know, sure. chocolate, uh, we'd like to snack on learning uh, when we feel hungry, you know, and not, uh, there's no point giving me one big box of snack when I'm not hungry. So similar, and it's a simile, right? So talent says, I want learning when I feel that I have a little bit of a gap either to deliver my current role or there's something coming in the way of me growing into the role that I dream of you know um, and therefore can you give me something snackable that I can query um, and the that's one you know that's the first shift that is happening the second shift that's happening is gone are the days wherein the line manager or the people manager was the the guru, you know, uh, and the employee was the shishya, you know, wherein you said, okay, you are going to give me the input, I'm going to just learn from you. Uh, talent today is very dynamically finding ways of learning through multiple ways, you know, it could range from putting a query on Twitter. Uh, now we have chat GPT, wherein you can put in anything and it throws up 20 answers. So know-how is not at a premium because knowledge is available. Application is becoming at a premium and finding creative ways to find the answers when I'm hungry is something that people are finding their own ways to solve for. So at Mondelez, we have employees who meet in groups uh, or interest groups, you know, uh, following, uh, you know, ideas that they want to chase, uh, figuring solutions to problems through what we call the shark tank approach. So we're trying to create entrepreneurship, you know, within the within the enterprise. And as far as knowledge is concerned, we have something called MIU, which is the Mondelez International University. We have a few of our learning partners and their content lying there uh, so that employees can query and get the content that they would need. Uh, but we are putting greater emphasis on peer learning, creating platforms of exchange of information. And we do a lot of collaboration with our partners, including talent exchange for short term projects and gigs, which provide our talent, uh, you know, completely diverse experiences. And those are maybe some two or three things that, uh, you know, we are attempting at Montelas. Thanks, Ma. I think that's a very interesting initiative that you're talking about. First is about personalizing the learning experience. It is about democratizing learning, helping employees learn the way they want, where they want from, when they want to learn. I think that's very interesting in creating that ecosystem where there's learning, which is not top down, but bottom up, where people learn at their own will. So that's very interesting. Uh, John, any thoughts on what Maha just said? And can you also tell us a little bit about, with your experience of working with multiple organizations, uh, how are organizations looking at solidifying their entire learning infrastructure to develop and nurture the existing of talent. So if you could tell us a little bit about that, that'll be great. So I think as Maha was talking, I was just reflecting, right? So you can maybe break this down into uh, knowing, being, and doing. Mm -hmm. right? So there are three, three parts to it. And like Maha mentioned, uh, the knowing piece is something that's pretty much solved for, right? There's no shortage of content. There's no shortage of knowledge in the world around us. And there's no shortage of means to access knowledge on a real-time basis. When you want it, where you want it, in the format that you want it. Right. Uh, so the challenges have shifted to the being piece and the doing piece, right? Uh, and uh, being becomes very important. So, mm -hmm. like you said, people may want to opt out of certain experiences, but mm -hmm. the organization feels that no, you have to mm -hmm. gain those experiences for you to just become that mm -hmm. person in that role mm -hmm. in an effective manner, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, how do you help people maybe shift mindsets to get into the being zone? Right. A lot of people know what has to be done, but that doesn't mean that they will do it. Right. Why? Because there's a being gap that comes in. Right. So one piece is that. Right. And I think that's where, uh, you know, uh, the organization's experience, leaders, line manager experience still counts today. Uh, because for younger talent, they may not really have the perspective required to uh, kind of make those calls for themselves all the time. Right. Uh, the next part is the doing gap. Right, where uh, I may have the knowledge, but do I have the skill? Uh, can I apply? I'm able to navigate a complex environment where things change. Right. So while in the learning classroom, you know things look very nice and neat and clean, 
on the ground it becomes very messy right and things are not so neatly frameworked and you know laid out uh, so how do i apply in the messiness of reality right uh, so uh, i think some great initiatives that you guys are already doing uh, you know to replicate those environments and help people learn uh, so i think the more organizations can do that i think uh, the better the learning is for them yeah and i'm just reflecting yasmin on this whole piece yeah. on perspective you know mm -hmm. uh, and how might we share perspective more and more and maybe if it's relevant to the audience one of the things that we played with in mondelez and now it's become a ritual is something called growing here weeks okay mm -hmm. so there are a few weeks every year where globally we say it's the growing here week it started as one week and now it's a few weeks um, and what we do there is actually have many conversations you know uh, so there are conversations with experts with people it could be about life it could be about different topics and there's a calendar and it's open for anyone to come in and join and be part of the conversation not just as a listener but at times as a conversation uh, because there's tremendous power in learning from others experiences not just experiencing it and learning by doing uh, but learning from what others have done uh, so it sounds simple but very powerful because it became a platform where leaders across levels started sharing their learnings and insights from their careers and it became we also realized that for early talent hearing from very senior leaders seemed like something very far away but hearing from people who are maybe a few years more senior than them uh, made learning take a very different shape uh, you know and they were follow through conversations how will we apply it in our teams uh, and leaders and colleagues started having that hunger to say how are we going to apply you know how do we translate from knowledge to doing uh, and how might we experiment and share what we learned and what we struggled with and keep that journey live and i think that was an experiment that went very well uh, something that we uh, we are pretty passionate about at mondelez mm -hmm. so your your articulation of knowing doing being and being is an interesting one right uh, reminded yeah. me of that so, okay. yeah, yeah. I think interestingly, what I can hear from the both of you is how can you embed learning in the day-to-day -day life of an employee? I think that's very important. If it's relevant, if, if you create that kind of a learning ecosystem where they can learn from each other, they can learn by from doing, it doesn't look like an external pressure of you know going through a, a particular program or a learning initiative. I think that is where learning becomes more solidified in an organization, embedded into the culture, embedded into the day-to-day -day working, enable and empower them to learn from each other. I think that's the way forward. So great point. Points there. Thank you so much. Now coming to the final question for this interview, Maha, I'd like to hear from you first. And you did kind of take us to, the, to some points regarding that earlier in your answers also. What are the top three skills amongst the many that there are already? But according to you, what will be the top three skills that will power the future of work? I mean, to my mind, the first one absolutely is learning agility. You know, uh, so if you know how to learn, you can go through anything that, that comes your way. Uh, so that is definitely probably a dominant one in my head. The other two or three perhaps would be the ability to imagine possibilities. Uh, so imagination, you know, in some ways, uh, but not in the in the space of stories and imagination, but imagining possibilities and, you know, solutions kind of imagination. The ability to look at data uh, and then predict and therefore the ability to do foresighting, uh, if you will is going to be important and simplifying and the ability to take to have a judgment basis foresight and simplification and be able to take a judgment is perhaps something that's also important so therefore to summarize i would say learning agility really dominant out there uh, followed by the ability to look at data uh, to for foresighting and having judgment and last but not the least, having the imagination to think beyond. Uh, I think those are a few that strike me. Lovely points, I must say. John, what would be your three skills for the future? Yes, I think very difficult to disagree with Maha on any of these three. Yeah. Right? If I were to pick three, I think I would start off with uh, customer empathy, right? Okay. Which is basically, okay. uh, you know, because for you, almost anyone you work with is really a customer. It might be an external customer, or an internal customer, right? point, and there's yeah. a whole, uh, you know, like a whole chain of customers next to you. If you are from supply chain, you have 
uh, sales in front of you, your channel partners in front of you, then customer in front of you, for example, right? So knowing what each stakeholder might need and solutioning for that, right? And having that empathy for knowing what their lives look like and what their needs may be like, and therefore, what's the best possible solution you can do for them, right? So that's number one. Uh, number two is the uh, the whole uh, data analysis to data inciting to critical thinking, right? Which is very simple. Yeah. The point that you yeah. right? So that chain, right? That uh, basic data, can I analyze it? Can I get some insight? And can I then, over a period of time, convert that to foresight? Uh, and can I also critically analyze any situation? Look mm. at it from multiple points. Right? <clears throat> uh, and then also, uh, you know, one thing that I talk about a lot nowadays is uh, learning how to use AI in your work, mm. right? Uh, very new and evolving area. So uh, it's very unstructured today. But being able to figure out where there could be applications for AI, I think in the next two, three years, there could be a lot of game, game changes. Uh, one area I would pick out outside these three, uh, you know, as you are talking, I, I was just thinking through, uh, the importance of having a growth mindset, mm. right? It's not so much a a hard skill as such, but it's more of your mindset mm. that in a very turbulent and uh, very uh, fast changing world, a belief that growth can be there, right? That belief becomes very important, right? So moving from a, what we call a fixed mindset that this is how things are and therefore only so much are the possibilities, mm. right? Uh, to a mindset where you say that, you know what, there is definitely growth. Uh, and that's where the creativity and imagination piece also comes in, right? Mm. That having the growth mindset and then envisaging or envisioning, you know, what that growth could look like. How do you make that growth come alive? I think that becomes very important in today's world. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just reflecting as I, you know, as I hear you, you know, when we keep talking about, or at least I keep talking about, you know, the perspective from an employee's view and an organization's view. But if I look at leaders, you know, and perhaps, you know, one of the, and it's very close to your point on customer empathy, actually is listening, you know, yeah. uh, making the space to listen deeply and reflect, uh, you know, and therefore not just keep in that doing loop, you know, but the pauses, you know, that give us time to imagine, to reflect, uh, to listen deeply and do something with that listening are absolutely skills that uh, perhaps we need to keep uh, refining as leaders. Yes. Because only when we listen deeply will we be able to solve critically, um, you know, and I think keeping the time for the pauses, which is such a premium now, yes, man, you know, yeah. between all the tussles and demands of uh, all our stakeholders, yeah. personal and professional, uh, there is very little pause, you know, and uh, when pauses are rare, uh, we lose a lot. And I don't know if, we, if we've quantified that loss uh, yeah. adequately as individuals or as an enterprise. Yeah. So I was just uh, reflecting as I heard you. Yeah, I, I would maybe call it, you know, being able to filter out signal from noise, right? Mm, yes. What you yes. said. Nice. You know, right? nice. There's so much of stuff happening around, yeah. right? Uh, okay. Your ability to kind of absorb mm. everything around you by listening and then pausing, reflecting, and then saying, okay, what is signal? Yeah, nicely right? said. Signal is again what you also mentioned about how do you simplify, right? Yeah. So there's so yeah. much of data. But then when I go back to my teams or to, to other people around me, can I say, you know what, this is the clarity I'm, I'm kind of yeah. crystallizing. It's, it's lovely to see you live your purpose life, right? <laughs> <laughs> Great Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, that was very beautiful to put through. I think the best way to summarize this would be that, as John said it earlier, I think the whole learning ecosystem has transformed so drastically in the past few years. And the whole point on knowing, being, and doing is very interesting for me to know. How can you create a learning ecosystem which is more agile, which is which is more relevant in an employee-driven market? How can you listen more and create programs and a career development journey for your employees which is relevant for them and which also makes sense for the business? How can you make learning more uh, embedded into the culture of the organization, have that learning agility embedded into the culture of the organization? I think that is how learning programs will become successful where people can learn at their own will learn when they want to learn with, with, with their peers and learn and, and you know by learn by doing on the go i think that's going to be the future of it so on that note maha and john it was a pleasure talking to the both of you there was so much to learn from you thank you for joining us for this episode thank you. thanks yasmin thank you, thank you.
Great. And thank you, everyone else, for joining us for yet another wonderful interaction. Uh, it was a very intriguing interview. We'll be back with another lineup of sessions packed for you super soon. So stay tuned. And also, in case you've missed out on our previous episodes, do not forget to subscribe to view our complete Learn to Lead series on our website. You can also find the link in the description below. So see you all super soon. Thank you and take care.